Um, well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of the Demystifying Media events for this academic year. Demystifying Media is a new series that was established last year by our Carolyn S. Chambers professor in journalism, Damian Radcliffe. And the point of this series is to bring professionals into our building to talk to students and faculty about the changes that are happening in 21st century journalism. And this one is going to focus specifically on the impact the digital age is having on journalism and newsrooms. And it's my pleasure to welcome um, several guests here today. We are waiting on one guest um, whom I'm imagining may have been caught in traffic. Um, but um, we have several guests here that are affiliated with some of our experiential learning programs here at UO. We have one Snowden editor, uh, another Snowden editor on the way, and another editor who's affiliated with our cross-border, cross-cultural interviewing program and UO UNESCO program. So I will introduce each guest and give them a <coughs> chance to give an overview of what they're doing in their newsroom, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Um, so to start, I'd like to introduce Jerry O'Brien. He, <laughs> he is the editor for the Herald and News in Klamath Falls in Southern Oregon. He's been there for three and a half years. Um, last year, his paper took first place in general excellence in newspapers from the ONPA, Oregon News Publishers Association. He works for Pioneer News Group, which has eight dailies and 25 weeklies throughout the Northeast. And I think that's an important point that he's going to talk about um, in terms of how his newspaper is able to adapt to the digital age. He has been the editor of three dailies in Montana, <coughs> and he's a graduate of the University of Colorado Journalism School. So welcome, Jerry. Don't hold the, the CU grad against me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Buffaloes are doing pretty well this year, which is nice to see. <coughs> Okay, do you want me to just kind of? Yeah. Go for it? Okay. Yeah. So, um, our group, Pioneer News Group, is a pretty small uh, chain of newspapers. It used to be owned by Scripps uh, Howard or the Scripps family in the Northwest. Um, one thing they did a, a couple of years ago was they wanted to see where we stood with our readership. So, we did a readership survey. A lot of papers do readership surveys. It's really important to see where you're at and then do another survey to see how far you've come. Um, really, uh, we partnered with American Press Institute, which is a pretty well-known uh, <coughs> group that uh, keeps a tab on what's going on in journalism today. Uh, and they did our survey for us, and uh, what they found was that most of our readership really is interested in the uh, four main key topics. Before I get into that, though, one of the things they had realized uh, with journalism, you know, how journalism is really kind of moving toward the digital age, as you all probably know. A lot of people don't read newspapers anymore, at least that's what you believe. Um, in our area, which is much more rural, uh, a little older a demographic, those folks are still uh, reading newspapers. In fact, um, across our market, 41% of our audience still reads print as the primary source for news. That's 41%. However, 25% is accessing us through social networks, uh, such as Facebook. And another 23% is going through our website. So we're seeing a trend grow there. Um, the mantra that we have really is, we are not going to wait for the readers to kind of pull us into the digital age. We need to go there as soon as possible. And you'll probably hear a lot of people talk about we're still kind of behind the, the curve, the ball on that one. And, and we are, so we're, we're trying to move that way. Um, what we decided to do in our news group is to pick out four key areas that readers would gravitate to, where we could be really strong with our readers and that they would stick with us as far as readership. In other words, newspapers today can't be all things to all people anymore, just because of a uh, 24-hour news cycle. We picked uh, crime and courts, outdoors, business reporting, and education as our four kind of pillars. And it turns out that uh, across the markets, 70 3% of our subscribers say they sus subscribe to us because of these four pillars or four franchises. We cover a topic that we cover it particularly well. Nobody else can, can beat us at it. 
And that's uh, kind of the focus of what uh, the chain has been looking at now for the past couple of years, is to see how those, um, those four pillars do. Each market kind of did it differently. They might have changed something up and they might have covered government more so than they did uh, crime and courts. But for us, those four really worked and resonated with our readers. And it turns out that our, our web views, and, and um, one thing I have to back up on this is, the way we measured this is API helped us develop a digital format or a, a metrics that we could actually record what readers are looking at it's much more deeper than what Google Analytics does for your websites. So in other words, every morning we would go through the newspaper, um, basically the website content by local bylines and designate where these, these stories fit into the four key areas, if they did or did not. And then after a period about a year and a half or so, we could track and see whether the readership is actually following us, if these four key areas are something that's resonating with them or not. Maybe we have to change it up to something else. And as it turns out, our page views are up about 115% compared to the year previously. Um, across the company, the loyal view rate has increased an average of 37%. This is all uh, looking at our website, uh, which means 40% of our views are now coming from loyal users. So as you can tell, we're shifting that way toward, uh, toward the uh, digital side, the online site. And um, real quickly, I wanted to jump into some other things too. That, that's been going on for about a year and a half, and like I say, API is, was the, the main pusher for that. They are, they're rolling out this kind of this software that uh, you can look at a, a dashboard every, every morning and see where you stand with your four pillars. I know this is maybe a little bit hard to read, but, uh, but when we see that uh, most of our readership over the last 90 days is still engaged with our stories, our four pillars, that they're up consistently, uh, we know we're going on the right track there. Um, a couple of other things we're doing real quickly is um, we're doing augmented reality content. Now, we partnered with a local community college that, that came to us. They have a digital media studies group. You guys might have one here in the school, or you might want to have one on the campus. And they designed some augmented reality for us, uh, which is, uh, you probably know what that is. It's uh, usually something is embedded in a story or a headline or a logo in your newspaper, and you scan it with a piece of software, and then it, um, Let's see. Whoops. It pops up with. Um, So what augmented reality does for newspapers is it kind of takes people, it gives people much more information, video, photos, uh, interviews, things that uh, they can reach with a tablet that the newspaper has exclusively. It's not something that you'll find on the website. Um, so uh, our kids at KCC did several things. We covered several stories like this. One of the bigger ones was we had a Babe Ruth World Series that took place at, over the summertime. And uh, one of the kids at the school said, well, let's do a, a baseball card with uh, the team. So with the software, oh, shoot. It's not as bad as you think. With the software, you just kind of scan over that, that, it, that photo or a marker that's in your paper. And they develop little baseball cards for each of the individual players. So the reader sees <coughs> this in the newspaper. They scan over it, and then they can tap on one of the photos of one of the kids, and they get a baseball card, a little information and stats about the player himself. That is very cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought that was, that was really interesting. And uh, so it helps, you know, with digital, that it helps to kind of partner with some other uh, uh, studies in your, at your university or uh, other businesses or colleges in your community to kind of partner and do some of those things uh, with people. All of these things have different uh, multimedia uh, attached to it, so that's pretty cool. A um, couple of other things real, real quick. We encourage all our reporters to use Tout, which is a, a, an easy kind of 
um, idiot proof type of uh, video shooting. So every story they go out on, they do a short little interview with somebody on the top video. The top video is attached to the story on the web, shows up there, and uh, it adds a little more multimedia effect to the, to the story. Um, we also just real quickly have um, decided to develop a thing called an app for citizen journalism. It's called You Report. Some of these apps are already out there now. This one's uh, made with a partnership with us and Microsoft and a company called uh, Posh Technologies outside of uh, Washington. You Report basically is uh, the way we're going to get this into the community is we're going to ask them, actually give them a free tablet, a tablet such as this. They will go. Uh, they will get the free tablet with a purchase of, say, a year subscription to the newspaper. So the newspaper <coughs> still is important to them. They get the newspaper as well as all the other um, information that we have uh, in that and on our websites. And they also get a free app that allows them to, if they see something like a car accident, um, a forest fire, or something like that, they can shoot some video, take some pictures, send it up to us because we can't be at all places at all times. So it makes uh, citizen journalism a little bit uh, more uh, useful to everyone uh, back and forth. The, um, the nice thing about that is uh, usually we hear, you know, with, with where we're, we're at, we are at, in the winter time there's a lot of closed roads because of snow and things like that. So we're hoping that folks that are on the scene of uh, an accident can send us that information right away. Um, and I have some other things too, but Really, the, the point is, we realize that newspapers are, are kind of moving into the digital age a little bit faster than, than newspapers themselves can, can do it. And so we're trying to, to keep up with the trend and maybe get ahead of the curve a little bit too. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to also mention um, that if you would like to tweet anything that you are hearing today, uh, please use the hashtag demystifying um, so that we can follow along with it. Um, I don't know which one of you would like to go next. Okay. So get over the trauma of <laughs> shooting campus. Okay. Okay. Well, then it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Javier Borelli. He is the president of Por Más Tiempo, the biggest media cooperative of Argentina which publishes Tiempo Argentino, a weekly national newspaper that is, according to him, one of the few voices to shed light on government corruption and abuses of power. It is the only newspaper in the country that is financed by its readers. And um, it is known nationwide or worldwide, really, because uh, its newsroom was attacked last 4th of July by 20 men who tried to stop the paper from being published. Um, Javier has received many awards, including the Dog Hammarskjöld Fellowship to work as a correspondent from UN's, uh, the UN's New York headquarters. Um, he was selected by the Iberis Foundation to take part in a five-month course about European political and social history in Spain, um, as well as many other, um, many other accolades. So please join me in welcoming him today. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I'm trying to be brief, but my English sometimes is not uh, useful for that purpose. So I hope I if you have any question about the pronunciation and stuff, uh, please, it helps me to get better also. So uh, as, as, as Catherine mentioned, my, the, I mean, the organization I represent is co quite different from the other because it's a co-op. Uh, it's a co-op organization that began after uh, the private owners of the newspaper where I where I worked uh, abandoned the the company abandoned the newspaper and the workers the journalists the designers the photographers decided to make it profitable again to show it was profitable again and to show that there was another way of doing journalism uh, besides from the commercial and and, and and maybe the mainstream ones what uh, we decided to do was to look at the um, at the context, to look at this uh, at the situation in which we were, and try to get the 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 best out of that. Uh, be, that's why I would like to uh, to to talk about digitizing our newsroom, since we we passed from being a, only a newspaper, a printed newspaper, everyday printed newspaper, to a business model that includes a weekly newspaper on Sunday and a digital newspaper from Monday to Saturday. So it's, it's, it's a situation in which 
we work pretty much the same in incorpor incorporating some stuff of the digital age that we haven't before. For example, now photographers also made some short videos uh, to introduce or to make just uh, audiovisual material about news. And also we are starting to, to work in, in, in a two-way uh, organization or routine that I'm going to explain a little bit. The main, the main uh, motto or slogan that we started to use was that understanding that we weren't in a situation of cr crisis for journalism. It was a business model crisis that we were living on. So we decided to develop a strategy in which the newspaper on Sundays was not only a way of getting money for what we were doing, but also we decided to create like a membership affiliation to the newspaper so that affiliates could get the newspaper for free on Sundays, but also from Monday to Saturday, they could receive the news in advance to the rest of the people. For example, we were used to send the newspaper to the print by nine o'clock at night. What we do now is we put the information, uh, up, we upload the information to the website and the people that are members can access at nine o'clock in the night the same things, the same material that other newspaper would give you the morning, the following morning, so that they have this kind of benefit. And it's maybe interesting for them so that maybe be, before going to sleep, they can look around and they can already think about what, what happened during the day. And it's produced information. It's not just maybe something that they have uh, brought from a cable agency. It's something that has been produced during the day and it's extra information. But the thing that involves them to, to be members is not that to receive it a few hours before. It's this way of doing journalism, a co-op way of doing journalism, a way that is try to be at least not influenced by any political or economical power. And we found it since we began, a lot of people interested in funding this kind of journalism. We have in the six, seven months, we are already in the street as a co-op. We have 2,500 members, but sorry, 2,500 people that is supporting us. 1,800, they are subscribers, just subscribers, and they just received the newspaper. And we have 700 affiliates or members that they also put around $6 a month extra, and they receive all these benefits. All these benefits also include some journalist courses we do, it also includes some cultural activities we organize, and it's also a way of inform a, a way of getting news to the people from another another perspective, from another point of view, and building a community around Tiempo Argentino. Uh, I believe that is important to say in terms of digitizing because it's something <coughs> that we have to discuss in order to get to the digital situation in which we live now. We have to understand that journalism it was not anymore a thing of just a newspaper. It was a, a, a thing where the legitimacy of the information you produce is, uh, is, in our case, given by the readers, the readers that support this kind of journalism. So we are starting to learn how to do this. Uh, up to the date, as, as, as Catherine mentioned, we have the 75% of our income that comes from memberships and also sales on Sundays. Uh, on Sunday, so it's a lot for 105 people that we we integrate this co-op, and how we how we do it. Well, we have a, a few a few things that we are learning. I mean, this is a process of learning because we weren't prepared to, to be to, to do this transformation into a digital age. So we are learning about that. What we learned is from the struggle we gave since we stopped being a private corporation in, 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 until we become a co-op. A lot of people began to read. What, what we were saying about our situation. We become some, somehow part of the news, what we were doing. Making concerts to give visibility to what, to what we were suffering and stuff. That made our, um, our social networks to increase our followers a lot. We have around 400,000 followers in Facebook and in Twitter. And the 80% of the people, that, the visitors of Tiempo Argentino you know, uh, homepage come from the social networks. So we found that we had to go where the people are to bring them to Tiempo Argentino. And it was uh, really interesting to see that. And that was maybe by chance, by, by, by essay and error. I mean, we, we tried it and we see it worked. Uh, nowadays we are in seven months, we got to be the sixth uh, media outlet in Argentina in terms of audience. 
uh, of digital audience. And the five that are above us, they are um, organizations that have, the, the, the younger has more than 10 years there, <coughs> and the oldest have more than 100 years. It's considered like the, the one that gave, gave birth to the history of uh, newspapers in Argentina. It was even founded by a president of Argentina. Uh, so it's somehow we, we are finding that people is interested in supporting, reading the kind of news we are, we are producing. And that also includes not copying the bad examples, not making this uh, maybe this way, of, this way of attracting people and saying, do you know what someone said about, no? And maybe that's the easy click. But we know that our, our goal, our, our legitimacy is given another kind of information, processed information, information that is useful for the people, for the working class, for the scholars. And we also develop uh, with this with this approach to journal to journalism, we got lots of young people to be involved. We are the newspaper, the printed newspaper that has uh, the the best um, how do you say the best uh, or, or the younger audience. We have people from their twenties that are buying the newspaper on Sundays, and that's a weird thing all over the world. <laughs> I mean, newspapers are for and I'm sorry because I'm I'm a reader of newspaper are for old people, for adults. <laughs> But now we have lots of people from the 2,500 people. I believe that maybe half of them should be below 40 years. And that's incredible. It has to do with the struggle we did until we get a cooperative and, 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 and the way we show <coughs> that we were the same, that we were doing everything. And our mistakes sometimes were mentioned by our readers. They send us a tweet saying, look, in this article you did that stuff. And they send us, for example, pictures with them with the newspaper saying, I have Tiempo Argentino, I support this, this way of doing journalism. And that also, it's like, I mean, we, we are like learning and getting grow with the community. And I think that that is a good way to develop this, this, this reader financed way of doing journalism that is quite different. In Argentina, as I said, we are like one of the sole voices that is criticizing the actual go the current government right now. And so that we don't have pretty much advertising because no company wants to be attached to a media that is criticizing the government now that it's in the, in the first years, you know? It's, it's better to be with the government because who knows what would you like to ask them afterwards. Tiempo Argentino comes from another story, so we could be able to develop this model financed by people. And now we are seeing that Clarín, La Nación, these big outlets that I told you before, uh, are trying to do the same. They are trying to copy the, some things of our speech and saying we want to build a community. <coughs> it's important to, for readers not only to buy the newspaper, but also to be interactive with us. It's, it's, I think that this uh, situation in which we were, this situation that none of, them, none of us wanted to be, allowed us to try, to create, to do something different. And we found lots of people interested in that. Another uh, issue that is interesting for me is that we have a two-minute average reading of each article we have in the website. And that's a lot. I mean, it's too much. Uh, <laughs> but it's related to that. It's related to not putting every story, but the stories we think are valuable and are maybe uh, are going to be a spot in the agenda of the news of the day. And finally, uh, another way of organizing with it that is different from, from before. Before, as a newspaper, as a printed newspaper only, what we did was working from uh, 3 o'clock uh, of the afternoon until 9, 10 o'clock, something like that. That was our, the hours we were in the newsroom. Now we have three shifts that start at 8 o'clock at morning and ends up at 10 o'clock at night. And we have also three ways of working of producing information. In the morning, we have so the stories that we produced the day before, we try to update them and to be uh, alert to the breaking news. Something can happen in the Congress or whatever. In the afternoon, we have a little bit of breaking news and start producing the news for the rest of the day, for the, for the other day. And during the evening, what we do is to prepare to set up all the stories that the next morning would be online to be like the digital newspaper for everyone and also so that at nine o'clock people that are members can read these stories as they would do if they were uh, maybe just subscriber and received the newspaper the other day they could read it before 
So we have to adapt and to change the way we work. You would find that maybe the editors are now younger. I mean, uh, it's funny that because we were like uh, people from sports were the youngest of all the newsroom. Now, those guys from sports are editors of the website because they can handle the, 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 the new tools, the new resources, much easier maybe than the editor of uh, culture in Tiempo Argentino that has 60 years, 40 years experience in, in, what, in what she does. She's still the editor of culture, but she's not the web editor. The editors of, of the web, we decided to be people who is more, um, maybe more, it's not adapt, but more comfortable with using these new tools. They can do a story five in five minutes, and, and maybe what we, fought, what we found during the first days what, was that people wasn't, maybe these editors that were more experienced didn't have the, the, the tools or maybe idea of how did that work, how to look for the trending topics and stuff. So we readapt also uh, that kind of things. And since we are a co-op and we work in a way, people <coughs> all at this time all earn the same by, by, the, by the money we produce. Just for now, we want, once the income is increasing, we would like to also establish some kind of hierarchy between, between the work because it's not the same just to write and to be an editor. But as so far we are at this point, we are all supporting each other and the editor, for example, this editor of culture, uh, recognizes that it's better for a, for a younger guy to be in charge of editing that edition. I know that this is maybe hard to, to expand to any commercial business, but that's how Tiempo Argentino is doing it now. And so far it's been very good. We are increasing our audience. And the last detail I'm going to give is that besides of how, being from zero to the sixth uh, media in, in, in terms of, of, of uh, visits uh, website, Tiempo Argentino pa uh, transformed from a 7,000 7, sales on November last year as a private company to a 22,000 sales uh, on Sundays uh, last month as a co-op. So something is happening. Uh, we are not sure what of all the things I mentioned is the one that is like the key of everything. But I suppose that a little bit of each thing is helping us to keep alive, to keep working, and maybe to keep trying again uh, another way of doing journalism. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to just pull out quickly. Um, I, I heard something similar, both ver two very different media outlets. <laughs> and what one thing I heard that was similar was that each of you is focusing on not being everything to everybody, mm -hmm. to focusing your news efforts, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, and now I'd like to welcome Jan Boyd from OPB. She is the Director of Digital Strategy and Engagement. And she has deep experience in creating digital strategy for broadcasters. So um, it's also going to be interesting to hear a from the broadcast side here. Um, her background includes launching digital projects, building strong teams, and producing award-winning content for stations in San Francisco and Texas. She's been honored with an Edward R. Murrow Award, as well as several <coughs> Emmy and RTDNA Awards, a Telly Award, and multiple Emmy nominations. And she has a degree from University of Washington and an MBA from University of Texas. So thank you, Jan. I know, sorry. <laughs> we, we still welcome her. I always feel my parents are Oregon State graduates. And when I went to apply for college, they said I could apply to any school in the world except for this one. <laughs> so every time when I come on campus, I feel vaguely should I be here? <laughs> but it's such a uh, wonderful department, and I've met so many talented students through our Snowden program. Uh, it's tremendous. Um, I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that they were talking about, but before I do, just seeing how many folks are students, um, and are you all aiming in kind of the reporting, editing direction? Okay. So what I thought I would talk about, I think the business model is super interesting um, and it's something I think about a lot but I think what I'm going to focus on for you all is talking about how we've changed how we've worked um, 
OPB is interesting in that it's a dual licensee, which means that it's both radio and television. We essentially have three radio stations and television with a lot of um, locally produced content, um, which makes it really interesting. Um, but I think it applies, what I'm talking about applies to any broadcast newsroom that I've been in. Um, and what it kind of comes down to is figuring out the tools and the cadence and the pace and what do you do when. Um, so what I thought I would do, let's see if yes, this, you can just hit that. Okay. Yeah, let's see that. Yes. Yeah. Um, and go through four questions, you know, four big questions that we talk about internally. Um, the answers are pretty easy, but the execution is hard. So I'm gonna just skip ahead and say, what is a story? Where is your audience? How do you stay relevant? And how do you get it done? Um, and then I'm going to go, oops, back the other way. Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This screen is a little bit off. Oh, no. Okay. I scooch it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actually, I think um, it's not going to matter too much because I think you can see that. Um, the biggest issue, and I think the thing that is most relevant for you and your careers, is how do you think about what a story is. Um, you know, when I got into television, it was about crafting the perfect piece and worrying about the balance of the picture and the writing and the sound and the natural sound and putting together this package and then delivering it. But now, you know, stories across so many different platforms, stories break down into elements. They're video, they're text, they're audio, essentially. So having the flexibility in your thinking about what a story is and not getting hung up on the platform, oh, I'm a newspaper reporter, oh, I'm a radio reporter, oh, I'm a television reporter, that is really going to stand you in good stead. Does that make sense? Um, then the just brutal reality of where your audience is. Um, I quote a lot a New York Times um, mobile guy who stood up at a conference and said that one of the things he says inside his newsroom is, you can't think that what we do is so precious that people are going to come to us. And I think that's something that we really take to heart. So your audience is mobile, email, social media, um, desktop, through links on search, um, mobile alerts, like my phone that I can't find and I hope is turned off inside my bag. <laughs> Um, I'm really hoping that when I pull it out, I'm going to find the mobile alert that talks about the fact that one of the jurors was just dismissed in the um, trial, the Malheur trial. Um, that in itself is a story. Just what you put on that mobile alert is a story in itself. So thinking about the fact that your audience is in different places throughout the day, how do you serve them <coughs> and how do you tell those stories? Um, and the way I think about it, the way we talk about it a lot, is in the form of a circle, a clock. We know what time people are using what platform. So for instance, at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., what, what device do you think people are accessing media on? Guesses? Something. Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the things we're doing is we're about to launch an email newsletter. Um, that will have some headlines, it will have access to other content, and it's also going to mention, oh, by the way, Jeff Norcross is going to be interviewing so -and -so <coughs> if you turn on the radio at 710. So the idea is get people where they are on the platform that they're using and then move them across to the different platform platforms throughout the day. So I was, again, I was really pleased driving down. We just completed something we're calling the Visual Voters Guide, where we did seven minutes, seven one minute explainers on ballot measures for the state of Oregon. Um, and so we have opd.org slash ballot 2016. If anybody wants to check and make sure the link's working. Um, and, and it lays out in a really clear way um, what all those ballot measures are. But the way presumably someone could find out about it is they could be driving down to Eugene, they could have the radio on, they could hear the latest political story, story of the day, and at the end of it, for all of election news, and by the way, opv.org slash ballot 2016. 
So it's not complicated at all. It's just tricky to what kind of content, what place, what time of day, and how do you integrate it across the different platforms. Um, how do you stay relevant? You know, in public media, that's a big question. You know, we talk about having an older audience. We have a much older audience. Um, but what's interesting online is that <coughs> we are seeing a younger audience, but we're also seeing a balance. When I look at our numbers, our demographics, I mean, 18 and under, not so much. But going up to even the over 50 and over 60, we're holding strong, but then we're also seeing growth in those younger demos. Um, and it's because we are where, first of all, we stand for quality in a certain type of journalism, but we're putting that out there on the right platform at the right time. So part of a conversation, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this right, part of a conversation that we've had inside a newsroom and every newsroom that I've been inside of is explaining the concept of how you relate on each particular platform plays on your credibility. So it's not enough to do a story that's factually accurate. It's not enough to do something that's well written for newspaper or a television broadcast script. Part of your journalistic credibility is how well you understand the language of each platform, how well you communicate in social media, which is different than a mobile alert, which is different than a mobile story, which is different than a desktop story, which is different than a radio spot. The story's the same. The basic content's the same, but the approach is different. The tone is different, the voice is different. And also recognizing, you know, what works on radio or work, what works on a, a really stark example of what works really well on an early morning newscast is not what works well online at 8 a.m. Early morning newscast, television, commercial, it's about weather, it's about traffic, it's about, you know, what do I need to know? What do I need to know to leave the house right now? If we have traffic online at 8 a.m., everybody's already at work, <laughs> so that's completely useless. Um, so <coughs> understanding where your audience is, why they're picking up that particular platform, and what are you providing them is, is really key. Um, and then the most central, and this seems to be sort of the bane of my existence, is how do you get it done? Um, when I first started getting interested in multimedia, and I'm going to completely date myself, it was back in CD-ROM days, I thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Look at all the stuff that you can do, and you don't have to leave any video on the cutting room floor, and you can write as much as you want, and this is, this is awesome. Um, and it took a while to kind of get the technology up to speed. I remember the first time I tried to stream live show and it was a three camera shoot and it came across on the screen as a two camera. I don't know how. Um, and so it took a while for broadband to catch up. It took a while, you know, we were talking about user generated content. I remember when mobile phones were first coming out and people could take pictures. Yeah, it took eight up days of my existence to figure out how to get those photos in and then how do you get them online and how do you get them on air. Now that that's pretty much gone away. However, just because we have all of these different platforms doesn't mean we have more staff. It does not mean we have more hours in a day. So how do you get it done? Um, so it's about how do you create a workflow that still, you have to do the reporting. <laughs> you have to get the story. So how do you do that? And how do you satisfy all these different platforms? And who does what when? Um, and I spend a lot, a lot of time on that. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is kind of talk through, um, I'm gonna show you a couple of slides from a internal conversation that we had about video production and how to <coughs> incorporate um, online and digital distribution into some of our magazine show workflow. 
Um, so is that interesting? Do you want to see that, or do you want to kind of talk more about how to form? So I'm getting some yeses. I will um, just say maybe in about two or three minutes we should open it up to okay. questions. Um, so briefly, um, we've talked about digital TV and TV on the web. Um, and we can come back to this if um, you're interested. Just That's just length of video clips. Um, but just basically kind of creative differences between what broadcast stories are and what digital first video looks like, which is something that we're really <laughs> focusing on. Um, so broadcast stories, you know, that's just taking a segment and putting it online. Um, you know, it's accessible, you can view it before or after the broadcast and it has a long life. Um, you know, especially in our shop, having it more evergreen, um, so that's more magazine style and people, it stays relevant longer versus, you know, like a car crash or something that really doesn't have a lot of use. Um, digital first video, it's, again, getting back to the what platform and the cultural language of that platform, shorter, 30 to 60 seconds. Um, needs to be very clear, uh, no sound, we have sound on them, but no sound is required, um, and it incorporates text, and it's more of the moment and informal, but also speaks to our brand, and we can even talk about that a little bit if you want to. Um, we've done a lot of Facebook videos dealing with historical topics. Um, anybody familiar with Enchanted Forest up the road? How many been there? Um, <laughs> It's this 1970s, um, this one guy built this amusement park, and it was an anniversary, so we did a little video on the anniversary of Enchanted Forest, and I think it got over 500,000 views, and then just, it was like a torrent of comments, um, just because it was something that people really related to, and it was on Facebook, and it fit that particular platform. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a snapshot, and we can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, the fun stuff of all of this is having unexpected innovation. Things come from people that you wouldn't expect them to. You know, you've talked about age and getting mm -hmm. um, editors. What I've found is once you get people to sit down, I, I remember in one of my jobs, I, I literally trapped the anchor in the chair in my office and would not let her leave until she made a Facebook post. And once she got kind of the hang of it, I mean, she, she went nuts. Um, so once people are comfortable, they come up with a lot of um, different ways of creating things, and that's unexpected and it's fun. Um, the energy and the momentum, you know, we had a lot of success um, last winter during the occupation. I think we did 263 stories in 41 days online related to the occupation of the wildlife refuge. Um, it was pretty energetic, and the momentum of that has carried through the course of the year. The connection with the audience, um, that was one thing, you know, and I think usually coming up through the business, dealing with the people who call into the newsroom is just not your favorite thing. You know, you just try to really avoid being the person next to that phone. Um, but with this, you deal with people in a really, a lot more authentic way, and they inform the story as well. Um, and I have a couple of examples of that that we can talk about if you'd like. Um, and then just great storytelling. I think now is an age of being incredibly creative. You have all of these tools at your disposal. We have a video tool as well called Videolicious. Um, you know, we're working with SMS. Um, you know, the writing, the shooting, the editing, the sound, we're working in this <coughs> digital video, how do you incorporate sound from radio into our digital video in a different way, how do reporters, you know, there's one way to be on camera for television, there's another way to be on camera for online, it's just limitless possibilities. And I think, you know, business model aside, and that's a whole separate conversation, but for you all, I mean, I'm envious, the amount of ease in which you can tell your story has just never been greater. And now it's just a matter of putting it all together and just being a really good journalist. So it's it's pretty fun and don't let anybody say that now is not a good time to get into this business. Because I think it is. 
Thank you so much. Um, well, I certainly have some questions, but I want to make sure that students get a chance to ask questions. So, um, is there anyone who has a question they would like to ask our guests? Yeah. I had a question for Javier. Why do you think it is that you have so many youth leaders? I think it has a lot to do with the struggle with it until we until we become a co-op. Uh, once we, I mean, the newspaper stopped uh, publishing on February the 5th, and until uh, April the 24th, we weren't uh, capable of, of publishing another. During that time, we did lots of things uh, to, to give visibility to our situation. We made the uh, concerts in public spaces. We gathered 25,000 people in that. I mean, Tiempo Argentino has lots of, uh, had lots of uh, bond with, with the readers because of the issues we, we talk about. It was a working class uh, newspaper uh, from, from its side. It, it, it defend human rights, it defend workers' rights. And so when, when Tiempo suffer from, I mean, what, what, what you could call somehow like working abuses over the worker, I mean, we, we, we suffer from, from the ab abandonment of, of, of the owner and he didn't, uh, when we went to the Ministry of Labor to ask for them to, to, to be responsible for their actions, they didn't. So we, we start be showing that and lots of people from the community of readers and also from the community of musicians, actors, uh, um, rock bands and stuff that we interviewed through the past six years, they were very sympathetic to us. So they joined our, our things we did. And we did lots of community work in that because we convoked people to concert, we convoked people to, to be part of that. So they felt, they felt part of Tiempo Argentino. That's why we tried to work on the idea of community. And a lot of people during the last decade in Argentina uh, young people got involved politically uh, because because they liked the government some somewhat someone's and also in reaction <coughs> to those because they were against the government but that that made people to be active politically and this the actual the current government in Argentina is it's more like um, it's a social network uh, guided government for saying somehow now it's like it's that is the non-politician speech it's like they, they go to the UN and they take pictures of giving them a kiss and we, we, get, we put back the, politi the, the politic into stuff that is happening. We are showing what is happening, uh, what do you say, behind the scenes of that, of that picture. We even made a, an article about how that picture was constructed. I mean, we found that, for example, they show the president traveling in a bus and then we show that that bus was stayed they have police all over the place. The Secret Service was all over the place, and it was a it was a fake uh, picture, you know. And that kind of stuff made young people involved, made people like uh, uh, friendly with the idea of what we are doing. So it's like they join or they become members in order to support the work, and they start receiving also the newspaper. So they start reading. Some people write, and we put it in. We have a special page in the newspaper. It's the members page where we put everything they do or everything, the message they send us, no? And they send us pictures with them with the newspaper, they send us f pictures, for example, in, in a wedding that people is like delivering like uh, leaflets about be a member of Tiempo Argentino. And we also put them, I mean, we also make them <coughs> feel part of what we are doing. So it's like a funny thing. And they say, for example, this is the first time I read the newspaper. And it's, it's kind of weird, but I, I believe that it has to do it has to do first with the things we, we suffer and then with the things we did. I mean, the, the thing that we suffer made them to look at us. And when they read us, may the, they stay with us, uh, they accompany us in the process. We don't have even, I, I, I believe that the, the ratio of, of disaffiliation or, or unmembership I don't know how you say. <laughs> they let stop being members must be less than the one less than the one percent. I mean, we have we have six months. No, it's not that we, I can tell you about years of, but it's a lot. I mean, it's no one did that, uh, not knowing what they were doing. You know, it's like oh no, I made a mistake. No, 
they know <laughs> they know what they are doing and, and, and that's uh, a great support for us um, I, you know I wanted to just piggyback on that um, I was you know you've been very good at attracting young people um, but I was curious Jerry um, you know you said your readership is older yet you're trying all these really forward-looking things like the mm. augmented reality do you find that your readers even know what augmented reality is or how to use it and, right, and yeah. how do you let them even know that you have it well I think you know in a, in a rural community um, it's very difficult because it's not totally wired and that was always the, the fight for a newspaper is to say hey we have a website why don't you come to our website most of our readers say I don't even have a computer <laughs> and they still today say that and, it's, and it kind of shocks me which is one of the reasons that we we are doing something similar to what you're talking about is the real push is to make all the news available digitally throughout the week, but to put your your hard copy into one edition on Sunday, and you deliver that newspaper on Sunday, you offer a, a sales pitch that says, if you um, if you subscribe to our newspaper for Sunday only delivery, which cuts a lot of the costs on the business side of it, you get uh, you get all access to all our other uh, digital platforms, and that seems to work, and it also seems to work with the younger folks. And like I say, if uh, what we're trying to do is to put these types of tablets in the hands of readers that don't have computers, that have never seen one before. And so now they have access to all our news and, and then some uh, with it. So that really helps drive the readership up um, with our, uh, our younger groups and, and with the older folks that you know, aren't wired yet. So, so mm -hmm. it's kind of a win-win there. Interesting. Are there other questions? Yes, thank you. I have a question for Jan. Um, so, if I remember correctly, you said the Enchanted Forest video got one of the highest views. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, how do you get people to care about stories that they don't naturally gravitate towards, yes. but are important to tell as storytellers? I, that's a really good question, and that's the crux of it. Um, that's the talking about good storytelling. Um, so, for example one that we just did it's on our facebook page and um i should have bookmarked it uh, terminal one there in portland there's been a debate over the use of a parcel of land on the willamette Whip river for um, a homeless shelter not the most riveting topic um, but through the use of the reporter telling the story incorporating sound from interviews with city council people and the way we featured them. Um, we have an amazing guy that does animated graphics, which is a key element. Um, we put together something that I think is pretty compelling. So that's, for me, out of all of this, that's the most exciting, is how do you tell a story better? How do you tell something that's important and how do you do it in a way that people get it? So it's, again, what are the story elements? You have video, you have text, you have graphics, um, you have the writing, you have the way you deliver it, um, you have the interviews, you have this whole um, basket of things that you can use in order to get to them. Um, does anyone have another question? Um, I wanted to, if no one does, maybe piggyback again. Um, I'm really curious, um, you know, we have obviously students here and they're learning all these skills and they're learning writing and there's always this tension between keeping up with technology and the basics of journalism. <coughs> and I'd be really curious if you could let us know uh, from your vantage point as a hiring manager or editor, what, what's the most important thing you think students should focus on since there's so many things they could focus on? Well, really clear writing is important. I think you know, I didn't pay him to say that. But. <laughs> well, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, you see a lot of colloquialisms even drift into people's writings. Um, they say a lot of <coughs> you know, different things. And it, it's better to have clear writing first, but also, uh, inquisitiveness, and enthusiasm for the job, being able to approach people. I think I was a really shy person when I was in college. I was really nervous, and even in J school. And what, what it did for me was it got me out there and forced me to ask people questions. When you know 
when you get to do that more and more, you get to know what questions you're going to ask. And once you get used to doing that, you can sit down with a person and just go through an hour-long interview almost nonstop with questions. It's amazing how that works. So having that inquisitiveness is really important as well. And then the skill set really has to be not only being able to write, handle yourself on a computer well, and, um, and work across all the different platforms. I think you know, if you're comfortable with that, you'll get hired right away. I guarantee <laughs> Yes, uh, Yes, I have a question for Javier. Um, how the times that Argentina is, you know, is going through enhances the model that you have created? Or how are you responding to the transition that Argentina is experiencing? I believe that Tiempo Argentino wouldn't be able to exist in another situation, in another political situation. Uh, Tiempo Argentino is also benefiting from what we should say, for example, the a chorus of uh, of of uh, mainstream media organizations that are with the government, so that the few the few media that show something different, we are benefiting from lots of audience. You have to think that uh, during the last election, the party that won, they won by the by one. 1.5%. It, it, it was a it was a it was a balotage. What do we call the balotage? In the balotage, the winner was 51%, and the other one was 48%. Okay, those 48% of the people don't feel that the mainstream media is telling what is happening. So Tiempo Argentino is one of the, the of the only places where you can read that. I mean, there are a few more. It's not it's not the only one, no, but. That plus the story we have that is intimately related with the government. I mean, we suffer an attack the fourth of July that it is pretty much related in a in under the table way with the government also. So all that attracted the attention to us, and and we are taking advantage in a good way of that. So it is intimately related with that. And what I believe is that if we handle to to keep this model in which readers support us more than the advertising or more than any other kind of, of, of relationship, any commercial relationship beside that, I think we have lots of opportunity to, to, to keep on the track. Uh, and well, that's, that's at least at, at today, after these six, seven months since we are on, I mean, this is, it is strictly related with the political situation we are living but it is also a possibility to see another way of doing journalism in that way because we didn't want to create what we have created it was like the situation conducted us in this in this manner and so we are reacting over the context in which we are so it is intimately related and it, i think it's part of the success we are having uh, but if we made it maybe we can get independence for that and make a business model for a long time uh, that is financed by the readers. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. Our guests will be here briefly afterward if anyone has any last minute questions. Um, I wanted to just mention that the next Demystifying Media event is on November 11th from 12 to 1 in Allen 221. It is how NGOs blur the line between PR, journalism, and advocacy. I hope you might be able to join us there. And I wanted to thank you all for attending and also thank you to our guests very much. Thank you. <laughs>